Hey, welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Reverman. Dean, uh, hey, we got these things called mobile phones that we keep here on the counter with us. You use yours quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I got one of those. Yep, yeah. yeah. Use it all the time, There's a actually. reason why it's like sitting You still next call to it a phone? Because well, I, I don't know that I, I use it as a that, phone. That makes but, me feel old. Right, yes. I don't like. I don't use it as a phone either. I don't like to. <laughs> But mobile devices yes. have become rather ubiquitous in our lives, mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. personal lives. And we talk yep. sometimes on the show about the fact that, you know, there's no reason they shouldn't be pretty ubiquitous in the world of industry and True. in people's jobs. If you're yep. used to using them all day long, why wouldn't you want to have something familiar and similar like that to use in your work life Absolutely. as well? Now, in particular, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about retail mm-hmm. and hardware trends in retail yep. and where those mobile devices kind of fit into the story of retail yeah. and how that's changed over the last decade or so as, yep. as these devices have become popular. We have a great guest. We have Brett Cooper from mm-hmm. Blue Fletch with us today. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about you know what kind of attitudes he's seen change over the years as far as using mobile devices in retail. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about, obviously, what happened over the last year and how some of the things that occurred in the last year mm-hmm. and the trends that, that picked up uh, have heavily influenced the adoption of mobile devices mm-hmm. in retail. Mm-hmm. We're talking about rugged devices in particular because you can't Amen. just use any old device right. in, in, in most industries and workspaces. you know, you, you got to kick it up a notch. And we'll also talk about why Android is the preferred OS. I love that Android to topic, right? too. Yeah. Doesn't everybody yeah. love that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, even, though, you know, hey. even though we are iPhone users in personal life, Android makes so much more sense in a business sense. Bingo. And we'll talk more about yeah. that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Got a good one. Exactly. All that plus our usual what uh, value to the VAR and what's tech connecting with us. It is time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. It's time to get connected. Get connected. Get connected. All right. As I mentioned, our guest today, uh, Brett Cooper, is the founding partner and head of strategy for Blue Fletch Mobile. Brett, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got to where you are. Maybe explain briefly about what Blue Fletch does in the market as well. Got it, John. Uh, Dean, thanks for having me on today. Um, from a, a company perspective, uh, I started this company in 2008 with my business partner, Richard. So you probably, you guys have uh, met at the conferences. Uh, hopefully we all see each other again soon. But uh, yep. we started out, we, we, we came from a background of doing Windows CE, uh, which was the, you know, the legacy brick mobile devices in uh, warehouses and stores, a lot of big, big projects uh, from the enterprise consulting background. And started this right when the iPhone came out. So it was, uh, our, our name is actually based on like in 2008, when we started, there was this concept called Blue Ocean Strategy, which is going after something net new. and iPhone and sort of the smartphone was something new for businesses that everybody looked at. I remember one point in time, a CIO telling me, uh, people will never put iPhones in, into companies. It's not going to happen. Um, then two years later, they said the exact same thing about Android devices. So as a company, we we ended up uh, you know growing up during that period where all these brand new mobile, mobile devices came. And I, I think a lot of people forget that like you know, 13 years ago, there, there was no, you know, the ubiquity of all these things in our pockets wasn't, wasn't a thing that we had. It was a uh, it was you, know, you had maybe a BlackBerry if you were a baller, or you had a uh, um, you know a flip phone which you can maybe send some text messages to. Um, I was watching uh, Jason Bourne with my kids the other day, and it was it was amazing. My kids like, what's he doing on that phone? Um, but that's that's how we got here, and we've really we've grown up in the last uh, you know 12, 13 years doing a lot of big enterprise migrations for companies moving to new Android devices, and then. Along the way, we built a suite of tools focused on security for a lot of the uh, larger enterprises out there. And we can we probably dive into that a little further as we talk into some of the retail use cases you mentioned earlier. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, I, I I remember being like the expert on T9. Like <laughs> <laughs> when I got my first flip phone, I just being able to just like you're going to still it, make I that could, claim today. I am. I okay, could do it without right. even looking at it. I didn't have to pay any attention. <laughs> you like, did. Yeah. I knew exactly what I could do with it. it, it, it the sad thing is, I feel like I was better at texting on that than I actually am on a with the full uh, on a touch screen yeah. and, on a mobile device. Yeah. Like I, I truly did. 
I kind of, I almost, I almost missed that a little bit. I don't miss anything else about those phones, but, but I that, do kind of miss that a little well, bit. Hey, yeah. we can always bring it back, you know. I, suppose, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody's <laughs> created some kind of an app or a add-in or something that lets you do that on, on, a, on a smart device now. Oh, but, good times. Well, yeah. it, you kind of mentioned, obviously, you know, there's that progression and, you know, you know where we started. And, and when you think about it, all things considered, it has not been that long ago. No. You know, no, we're, we're talking, you know, you know, 10 to 15 years yeah. that so much has changed in yep. – the world of mobile devices and mm-hmm. and what we did treat as a phone at first, you know, mm-hmm. and we talked about mm-hmm. it, call them phones more often. You really can't anymore because that's mm-hmm. not their primary purpose. So, you know, what have, how how's that shift occurred to you? Like, what have you seen as far as attitudes toward mobile usage? You know, particularly in retail, since I know that's you know kind of a bread and butter for you. And, you know, how has that shift occurred over the last decade? And other than the whole, you know, oh, you know, we're never going to do this. Oh, we're never going to do that. And yet that still keep, seems to keep happening. What other kind of attitudes and changes have you seen over time? Yeah, I mean, I, I, even back more than a decade, I remember in the 90s, I was working in, in a retailer and uh, you know, I definitely had different jobs. One of them was a, a night shift where I worked in a warehouse and we did cycle counts. And a cycle count was you got a sheet of paper and you went around the warehouse and you got a section of the warehouse and you had to go count every single piece of item in that warehouse and you know i had a job at another sporting goods store in the late 90s and it was still the same thing where you're you're going and taking records of stuff on paper and then maybe going to a computer terminal green screen and typing things in and that's you know if you just think of how how potentially inaccurate that is compared to the accuracy you need with some of the newer demands on retailers now it's 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 crazy and when i say demands i think about you know, buy online pickup when i when i place an order i you know I, I go to google i search for something i see hey the shoe store nearby has the size i want you know and has it in stock at the store down the street i click on that ad from google it takes me to their website their e-commerce piece and i place an order i go to that store and i pick up that that shoe size that i ordered and it's it's and it works every time. Um, but for that to work, there's a lot of data and pieces on the back end that have to be connected to make that happen. And, and a lot of that has been dro- driven by the uh, you know the new mobile devices that people are using to track all the inventory and then some of the other adjacent technologies that are around it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the the throwback technology and it reminded me of my retail days, late nineties through mid two thousands or so. And I had to use the big clunky symbol scanner gun mm-hmm. thing that had mm-hmm. you know like 40 or 50 buttons on it and <laughs> you know the big broad yeah. scanner a little lcd led mm-hmm. screen you mm-hmm. know to, to read everything uh, that thing was just a nightmare it was not not as functional or as useful as anything anybody could use today what were you were you gonna add something there well i mean just in general when you think about mobile device usage in the, the retail space i mean yes we started to see some some of that happening prior to covid prior to the pandemic but but of course as we've talked about you know how it's exacerbated some of the needs that are required now and having inventory visibility in an online world is critical yep. and so how are you going to do that yeah i I mean, I'm, I'm with you, Brett. I, I, I came out of hospitality, so I was in a restaurant. But still, you know, those folks walk around and do inventory. I had my clipboard and, you know, how many, you know, things of cheese did we have? It's exhausting and it, even thinking about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. But but the, but the point of the matter is, especially on the re- retail side, you can't have that kind of an antiquated system and no. still expect to be a player today. And, and, and that has driven all the way down to the smallest retailers out there, mm-hmm. the mom and pa shops that have whatever whatever it may be, they need to have visibility of their inventory online. And so, you know, and, and appreciating the need for mobile devices there, and I think we're going to get into this, but obviously, and as our resellers talk to their end users about all the time, if it's going to be a mobile device, it needs to be rugged. It needs yep. to be an enterprise-grade yep. device because using a consumer-grade product might get you, you know, some of the way there, but you're going to quickly find that that's not the purpose-built device that you need in order to facilitate commerce in today's world. And so that's where, you know, mobile device usage, yes, a lot exactly. of shifting going on, a lot yeah. of usage for it. Well, then let's get a little further down that road then. So obviously, again, you know, stuff like Bopus, curbside pickup, mm-hmm. all the stuff that blew up over the last year, which, you know, they were they were trends that had been growing for some time anyway. Mm-hmm. And I think we were always going to get to that point where that was going to become the, the future future of retail, but it became a forced thing, obviously, over the yep. last year in order for a lot of businesses to to stay in business and survive. But obviously, that that did require a shift in, in the hardware side of things, not only the software side of it, but 
you know, you can't you can't go deliver something to someone's car and be able to scan something in or take a return or check something out or whatever and not have some sort of mobile device attached to that. You can't you can't be running back and forth in and out of the store to run to your computer, to mm-hmm. your, your station that's positioned in the store, mm-hmm. and not have something that can be that connecting point yep. there, obviously. Yeah. Right. So, you know, Brett, let's talk more about that and, and the demand on the devices that had to be implemented um, and what you saw around that over the last year. And, you know, as Dean pointed out, the idea that, you know, they got to go a little bit more rugged before we really talk about, you know, the rugged part of things and and how that really relates to these new retail trends. Let's talk about the consumer devices, because I think a lot of places probably didn't necessarily make that leap to the to the, you know, the rugged purpose built devices just yet, because mm-hmm. maybe they didn't have time for that or the money for that. Mm-hmm. So they may have been just, you know, operating off of you know, so, you know, mobile devices that are already in use by their, mm-hmm. their customers or whatever they could get on the cheap. But those don't cut it. Explain a little bit about why those consumer devices just aren't exactly what you need in this type of environment. Yeah, I think there's, when you say consumer devices, there's probably two, there's two core categories I think of. One is the uh, iPhones of the world, which I think you mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of us carry these in our pocket. They're spectacular devices. Apple has done a great job on protecting consumer privacy. And then the other is uh, the Android side of the house. So the, you know, the uh, WeWays, the um, you know, Nokia, the Samsungs, and you know, you can get a, a decent amount of hardware crammed into a device for you know, sub three hundred dollars. Um, I, I think those devices, just across the board, one of the things we we counsel people on is those those devices are are great, but they are designed for a single person carrying that device on their on their self. And you know, the even things like the the easiest. Um, thing for me to articulate is battery. Like you look at a battery, you know, current battery tech for like an iPhone, you'll get 500 to 600 charges and still be at, you know, full battery capacity. Um, if you think about a a retailer or warehouse where a device is used for, let's call it 18 hours a day, they're charging that device three or four times a day. So that, that 500 cycles is done before a year. And you can't just swap out the battery in an iPhone or most of the consumer devices. You actually have to send it in for repair. Um, and if you're planning on keeping that for more than 10 months, you're, you just need to, to budget that in. And there's there's a lot of hidden costs there. And then the other thing we've seen a lot too is the the rugged devices. So, you know, the Zebras, the Honeywells, the Dailogix, these guys, they've all grown up and they realize that these devices have to be managed at scale. You know, a company that buys 10,000 of these um, is doesn't want to have to go touch every single device when they make software updates. So they've, they've invested a lot. So they're the uh, rugged OEMs have invested a lot into building an ecosystem like APIs, um, focused around managing the devices, around securing the devices, around you know updating them and keeping them running for five years. So it's a it's there's you know there's a, a big a big difference between managing a consumer device you know for a number of years in a warehouse versus managing a rugged device. Rugged is just, rugged is just going to be cheaper over the long run. And I think that's exactly the point that, that so many end users did not realize, you know, coming out of the gate. Oh, yeah, I got this thing, and it seems to have the, the features and functionalities that are required. But quickly, quickly they realize that that is not a long-term solution Definitely for, for what Brett just talked about. Well, here. and the personalization side, I think, too, is the yeah. big part of it. For We love, yeah. as a consumer, as a person carrying a device around with you, you love the fact that you can personalize it and make it your own. That's mm-hmm. the great one of the greatest features of it is the idea like, hey, my iPhone and how I use it, what I do with it is going to be completely different from yours, from Brett's, from any other people I meet. That you know, I imagine no two people alive have the exact same configuration for their for their device that they use for their personal life. Of course, but right. that doesn't work when you're talking in the business world or when you're talking in, a, in an industrial environment or a mm-hmm. warehouse or enterprise where you need to know there's some consistency there and that everybody is kind of on the same playing field so that when you are pushing out updates or some new software, everybody's on the same level, everybody's at the same place, and it makes it easier to just to shove that out to everybody all at once and everyone's back on the same playing field with all those new updates. You simply can't do that if everyone's using a separate consumer type device that they've kind of personalized and made their own. Yeah. So. And, and believe it or not, also, I think some of the optics have changed. You know, as consumers, whenever I go and see to, I am, of course, I'm in the industry, so I understand when people are using ruggedized devices. But to me, it's it's becoming less and less prevalent that people are using unruggedized consumer devices mm-hmm. when I go to do BOPIS or yeah. if yeah. I do anything curbside. You know, you're starting to see a lot of people understand the value 
behind a ruggedized device. But part of the optics is also there that you don't want your, <laughs> you know, if you if somebody coming and picking up stuff from your store, you don't want somebody's just, you know, oh, well, hold on, let me get out my personal phone right. here <laughs> and scan that you collected this. And, right. You know, right? It's part of the part of the overall feels weird shopping experience, yeah. right? The yeah. customer experience is, hey, no, we want to show that we have technology here that, that's working, that's behind the scenes and that kind of stuff. So I really think that even even from the consumer perspective, they, people are, it, maybe they're not cognizant of it as much as we are because right. we're in the industry, but they understand, they can see the, you know, the difference between uh, whatever, yeah. a, a consumer device and a rugged device. Right. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to walk into the counter uh, and the person behind the counter is sitting there playing on the, they're, per, they're playing a exactly. game on the device yeah. or or, you know, texting or something, you know, or downloading music and be like, oh, hang on a second. Hold and, on. Hang, hang on a second. Okay. Let me turn off TikTok they, yeah, real quick. They flip something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They flip out or whatever to go to the, the program they need to do to do something for you. No one wants to see that. It's, no. It's a, it's a bad customer service experience. Yeah. And it just, it, it feels, it does. It feels it, off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brett, what were you going to add there? I was, I was going to say it's, it's even just the, the, the look of it when somebody pulls it. Like I, I noticed Dean took off his, uh, his pink, uh, what is it, the uh, sparkly case you had in your phone last week? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, for the show. Exactly. So you, you, you don't want to get embarrassed live. But yeah, when somebody pulls out the, you know, that the purple case or pink case with the, the diamonds on it, it's just, it's not the yep. most professional look. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The bunny ears <laughs> sticking off the top. Yeah, 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 I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm so glad you take that off for the show, Dean. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's hey, very, very hey, nice of you to do that. Right. So. It's little things, right? Yeah. Uh, well, hey, then let's let's get into those rugged devices then and and why they help enable some of these new trends in retail. You yeah. Know, where, where a rugged device is much more, you know, handy and useful mm-hmm. and important to have in your pocket and, and on hand when you're doing BOPUS, when you're doing curbside. Mm-hmm. When you are trying to to you know get that inventory accuracy and and that level of uh, insight into oh, yeah. your inventory, uh, if you're trying to adopt omni-channel into your retail environment, mm-hmm. so uh, you know Brett, let's let's talk about that. What are some of the the key components of a rugged device that helps you take that next step and take your retail business where where you want to be for these trends and where the future is going, uh, versus if you were trying to use a consumer device instead? Yeah, I think the. It's a good question. There's a couple areas that come to mind. Like the, when you think about the purpose of the device, is a good place to start at. And those devices, there's a couple things. One is scanning and fast scanning. People say things like, "I can scan with a camera," but it is it'll never be as fast as scanning with an imager or, or a, a purpose-built, uh, uh, you know, laser scanner on the top of a, a mobile device. Those things are just so quick if you're doing things like trying to capture inventory and for BOPUS or click and collect, depending on where, what country you're from. It will, you know, you need to have inventory accuracy to make sure that somebody doesn't show up to a store and is disappointed you didn't have the, uh, you know, whatever they ordered. Um, so that, I think the scanning pieces and just having that built in is, is important. Um, along those lines, the accessory ecosystem um, is another big one. When I, when I think about accessory ecosystem, it's you know, the most basic or fundamental one is, you know, you have having what people call cradles. So if you walk into a lot of retailers like a, a Lowe's or Home Depot in the, in the place where they store devices, they're gonna have cradles of devices. They'll have their 20 devices and you just drop it into the cradle, it charges. And you know the devices are, you know, they take them out um, as opposed to having to plug in a, a USB cable or some other third party cable for a consumer device. Just like the, imagine the wear and tear on a, a cable that gets plugged and unplugged uh, 50 times a day by uh, different employees or 50 times a week. Like, um, you know, that accessory ecosystem also goes to things like, um, uh, holsters or uh, vehicle mounts so in the warehouse. You see a lot of people that have the devices that are actually on the forklifts, and those pieces. There's those devices are are they think a lot about how they're going to be used in those scenarios when they build them and manufacture them. So there's a lot of effort that's gone in and research and development from the OEMs and on the rugged side. And then I think the other thing too is the the just in general the when we talk about rugged, I don't know if people know what that means, but if you've ever been to one of the manufacturers and looked at how they do testing, they're actually doing um, like IP testing, what's called mil spec. So they're like military grade and there's things like a drop test. So if I take a device and drop it on the ground from six feet up onto concrete a hundred times, will it still be functional? And these, these companies actually run those tests and they have machines that are finely calibrated. They have these things called tumblers where They'll tumble the device a thousand times and see if it still works. Um, they have specific things around moisture and heat and temperature where those devices are. They just have ranges that you, know, you put a device at a loading dock in Arizona, it's going to be 114 degrees. 
Um, if, I don't know if you've ever taken your iPhone and been outside when it's that hot, but your iPhone will literally shut down. Um, and you think about all these things that go into ruggedization. It's, it's really, uh, you know, it doesn't seem that important until you start deploying you know, 50,000 of these out across every single environment in, in your uh, country or across uh, across a continent. Yeah, I can remember that I, I, early on when people were using more of their consumer grade products that it, it, when, you know, there's that moment where you have the store representative or whatever using that kind of device and it's going to drop eventually it's going to yeah. drop and it, it drops it skids across the floor yeah. and there's that oh, moment like oh my god <laughs> is the screen broken and stuff like that i mean yeah it happens but you know rugged devices enable i think you know uh retail commerce if you will in a lot of different ways that i'll, I'll throw a couple of new ones or in, in kind of augmenting what uh, what brett was just talking about there let's dive into that inventory a little bit because you know inventory is hypercritical and and quoting off of your a blog that you guys have on the blue fletch site which is awesome by the way they have a great article on here that, that kind of dives into that but do the various ways consumer shop retails need to have inventory accuracy in the 90 percent plus range i wholeheartedly agree with that right you have to have accuracy because we've talked about how customer experiences can just be so poor when you you think you've bought it online and you're going to go pick it up in the store right and you get there oh sorry no, we're actually out of that product. Right, Whoa, right. What? You know, that's just creating that would create a nightmare scenario. So, um, you know, as inventory accuracy is more and more prevalent, you need ruggedized devices to enable that. Right. You right. need devices that are going to be on the floor, whether it's front of house, you know, doing inventory counts or back of the house that's doing an inventory count. That's critical. Look, a lot of that information I just got back from retail now. And I can tell you that AI is big. You know, the, the desire for a couple things here real quick. You know, resellers are looking for new ways that they can get innovative products into the hands of their end users, right? They're looking for ways in which they can do that. How do we use the data that we're capturing and further manipulate it? Inventory is going to be one of those. You know, if you put a little bit of AI, some smart, you know, computer uh, com computing in the in the background about their inventory, you know, what what levels they should be at, there's going to be a need for that. So you got to get accuracy on the data side coming in. You got to have purpose built devices that can do that, right? Yep. And so that's going to be huge. Another thing that you know we don't talk about this a lot anymore, but pop up stores. You know, I think that you're going to start seeing a lot of pop up stores that are happening again in the retail space. Uh, once these all these environments, these flex environments are out there, look, those companies are are going to get smart to the fact that they need some ruggedized devices out there as well. They can't rely on consumer. Right devices right. so anyway just a couple of, of areas additional areas above and beyond what brett was saying yeah. there yeah i think one of the other things that stood out to me too it, it just reminded me of one thing is you talking about the whole idea of pop-up stores mm -hmm. and not when obviously you use a consumer device well i could see in a pop-up store where somebody basically is treating those devices as their entire pos oh in yeah fashion. you know yeah. like they, they may have like a you know a, a mobile pos software mm -hmm. that they can take all the payments and do everything they need to do there they can mm -hmm. check inventory they can check stuff in and out uh, anything Thing they might need to do can happen from that device but again that security aspect is going to be hugely important and while yes we understand that like apple and, and consumer devices are you know often meant to be as secure as possible i think when when someone feels again that they see those device that's been built a purpose-built device from a you know a no manufacturer that it, you know they expect it to have that kind of security mm -hmm. and that kind of basis of security to it where again you might feel a little more comfortable going and shopping from this place and not mm -hmm. just joe schmo with his iphone right yeah you know with a little reader thing attached to it for your car swiping cards or mm -hmm. you know or they're scanning things in or whatever you, you you probably will feel a little bit better about it when it feels like it's a real oh. device that was that was built Absolutely. for that particular purpose yeah and then the other thing too i think is communication side of things which yeah. uh, you know again as you're as you get into these environments where if you're in a whether it's a big box store or a, just a small retailer that's got somebody working in the back room or maybe you're maybe you're out doing that pop-up thing somewhere or mm -hmm. you've got someone out in the field you know uh, doing a, a little mini event where they can sell some items, mm -hmm. being able to communicate with internally with your staff mm -hmm. is is very important. And I feel like a lot of these new devices they come out now are, are much stronger and and are forward thinking about how are we doing communications. Do we have mm -hmm. nice push to talk communications yep. in house? Yep. Uh, do we have you know cellular communications? Are we taking advantage of five G as it's coming along? Is it is it easy to talk to someone at the back of your warehouse through all of the product and rows of merchandise? 
patient dies. Absolutely. As, as easy as it is to talk to them if they're right next to you in the store. And I think that's that's something, again, that a lot of these devices are building into their DNA and to, into how they're built to make sure that someone has that communications capability. Clear advantage. I mean, I was just at a store, you know, uh, recently, and that happened, you know, in-house. You've got people that are working in the front of the house, quick push to talk to see if they have inventory in the yep. back of the house. The customer experience is great. You know, I mean, yeah, okay, we got this. Yeah, we got one of these. Or, no, we don't have this color, but we got this color. Again, you know, consumers, when they're actually in a retail environment, they want that customer experience to be as frictionless as possible and having great communications that mobile ruggedized mobile devices bring to the table. Definitely a, a yep. winner. Yep. And a stat that came from that uh, yeah, blog think, post that you mentioned. Oh. Sorry, Brett, I'll get back to you in a second here. That, that uh, blog post from Blue Fetch's site said, Business Wire estimates that the rugged device market will grow by $1.67 million through 2024. So hmm. that screams opportunity right. to me right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brett, what were you going to say? Yeah, I think one of the other things, and I know on the consumer side it's important when we all shop, but you know, looking at employees too, I think we've all read the stats. Like Companies are having a hard time retaining employees right now. Coming out of COVID, that's... Mm-hmm. It's definitely a big concern for a lot of people. And I've, I've been talking about this as a company. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about UX and user experience. And it's from the standpoint of an employee. Like, I'm a, a 22-year-old. I had a, 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 you know, I'm not a person of 22, but just put yourself in their shoes. I mean, John might be. But, um, <laughs> you know, for for us, like, you know, if you think if you're, you're somebody who's always had a cell phone, has always been able to text all of your friends, get questions answered immediately, and then you put them into an environment where you want them to work, but they don't have the, those tools or that that technology available to them. It's it's a it's a non-starter. It makes the job makes the job suck for them. And you know you have um, you know I was really surprised when I saw people start to put in um, some of these tools around like you know Walkie's been around for a while, but you know start to put in things like uh, I think Zebra's got their Workforce Connect, which you can do like texting and sending images. And I was blown away by how much the staff and some of the stores I've been to are actually using that. Yep. And, you know, not for voice, because, um, you know, we well know anybody who's under the age of 25 doesn't want to talk to anybody on the phone. But they're like texting and sending images and stuff in using that as a communication medium. Um, it's pretty impressive. So you get the, the things like Workforce Connect, Microsoft Teams are starting to become a lot more prevalent for these devices that are out on the uh, on the floor for warehouses and stores and uh, logistics and drivers. Yeah, that's that's a great point because while you know we've been talking a lot about all the cool features that makes these suitable for you know ruggedization and enterprise environments and and you know all day long you know all day hard work type environments. The key part there also, though, is, again, we talked about at the beginning, this idea that we're all used to having these things in oh, our yeah. pockets. Right. So if we are using something similar in our day-to-day work life, mm-hmm. we also expect it to feel and be able to do similar things to yep. what we can do with our personal devices. Right. And you're right. You're dead on. If someone's preference for communication is a text or a message and not, you know, talking to somebody, I get it entirely, mm-hmm. then they want that feature to be available for them as well. And, and yeah, to your point, you know, a lot of people may not think that that's a selling point, but I would say, like, if you're a VAR and you're out there talking to somebody and saying, hey, this device can do this, and you think, well, that's not really that necessary. We can all just talk to each other, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Hey, go find someone on your floor, like you said, that's under under 25 or even <laughs> under 30 these days, and I promise you, they don't want to be pressing buttons and talking to someone and having conversations. They want to have a quick, faster, easier ways to communicate with one another. So great, yeah. very good point there. Yeah. Well, then let's wrap up with, you know, Android. And again, we, we we mentioned this earlier, and we've talked about Android many times yep. on the show. We had, we had mm-hmm. a whole episode about Android versus iOS and mm-hmm. you know, or other, other OS out there. But Brett, from your point of view, why has Android become the preferred OS for these type of devices, and especially in the retail market? Yeah, this goes back to one of the points I had earlier around you know, managing devices and you know, customizing them for a scenario where you have thousands of devices that are out across like, different facilities and plants. Like, the you know, iPhone is, is it's, and Apple talks a lot about this, it's designed to protect your privacy. They literally spent millions and millions of dollars on commercials in the last six months talking about privacy and protecting things. Um, if you want to manage 10,000 devices and you have no visibility into what's happening on those devices or no ability to put tooling on there to, to get visibility, uh, it's a non-starter. Like it's, you're, you're blind, you know, if you're ma- trying to manage this from an IT side, it's just really, really expensive. Um, so these, you know, one of the things Android has is it designed on an open platform, and then um, companies like you know the Zebras and Honeywells are putting uh, APIs that allow companies to actually manage and get visibility 
um, you know, get data and analytics and have sec advanced security features. Like for us, us as a company, we've built a bunch of security tools to help with devices in these shared roles. And it's just not something we can do on iPhones because they're not designed for a shared role and they don't have the APIs or any of the security features that Android has. And let's dive so. a little bit more into the security side because I think that's really, really important. And one of the areas that obviously Blue Fletch, uh, you know, excels there. Talk to us about some of that, Brett, uh, and some about what your package does there. A quick sidebar, because you know we're we're seeing a lot of Android adaptation out there, but part of the talk track about why it's so important is the security uh, features that you know obviously other resellers could enable it through Blue Fletch, correct? Uh, they could use your software yep. and and design it. So let's talk about some of those. You know, the login everywhere from the login to device management. To just walk us through some of those things there. Yeah, and we'll be at, uh, if anybody's going to Vartech uh, in October, Blue Fletch will be there showing some of this off. So definitely, definitely stop by and see us if you're, if you're down there. So plug for, for Vartech. Uh, there you go, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, for us, we, you know, when we started building software on Android devices in 2010 and 11, it was, you know, Android came out as a consumer phone. So it was designed for a single person assigned to a single device. And all of the security paradigms are really designed around that. So yeah, I carry my device around, it follows me. When you take a device and you put it into a situation where you have um, you know, an example I gave earlier, like a, a retailer that has 20 devices in a rack, I'm an employee, I come in, I grab any device I want. Uh, I want to be able to log in and have that device you know, customized to me. And I, I also don't want to have to log in 20 times a day to every single application. I want to get in once, use it for my shift and be done. And that's really the the user experience that we focus on is how do you have the security of you know, locking down and protecting those devices on one side and then on the other side have that really good user experience where as an end user, like I can focus on using the device just as like just like I would my consumer phone without having to worry about typing in 10 passwords a day or you know things logging me out uh, during my shift. So that's the the tooling we sell is designed around um, helping companies enable that security process for those shared Android devices. And mm -hmm. it's um you know, I think that a lot of people ask us, you know, how does it, how does it compare to like a regular NDM, like an AirWatch or Sodi or Intune? And I think, uh, you know, you look at our, our customer base is, is growing wildly in the last two years as people start thinking about more about security and, and the user experience. And like most of our customers are putting our tooling on top of a Sodi or AirWatch and just, it really makes the experience a lot better for the end users and also for the guys managing it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's those things that they're, maybe they're not thinking about. You know, again, we've got a lot of end users here that are that are new to the space. You know, they, they see the value. They're seeing what's happening with a rugged device. But the security side is something that you as a technology solution provider definitely want to make sure that you have the right solution in place because login and authentication is going to matter. User and device compliancy to their world is going to matter. Locking that device down... <laughs> And then, if if needed, recovering of, of the stuff that all these things that come into play there, really, really easy to do. Hey, Brett, I was reading another blog uh, a post about NFC and, and how that's t uh, helping to eliminate some of the password issues. Are you guys seeing some of that growth uh, over on your side of the fence, too, you know, using that near field communication? It's it's still a, a bit nascent as more companies start to move to different badge types or some of the badges that built in NFC, we're starting to see more interesting interest for us. Mm -hmm. For us, it's the, um, you know, during your shifts, like you have a device, you go on lunch break for 30 minutes. When I come back, I don't want to have to type on my password again. So we have a feature where you can you know, tap your badge in the back and it logs you right back into your session and you, you get going right where you left off, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's frictionless. You're not having to type in your 12 digits required corporate password that has, you know, five special characters, no repeating characters and whatever crazy rules the security guy has decided to put in place. Um, but at the same time, we have the, the security of knowing there's a physical token that you have on your person that can be used during your workday that we already um, verified at the beginning of the day. So it's it's starting to get there. Um, I think just the, the the basic, you know, companies are are trying to get the basic, uh, you know, crawl, walk, run strategy where right now they're going to the, the crawl, which is like we need to have security. We need to have single sign on. And um, that's the bulk of what we're seeing, probably 80, 90 percent. But there's the more advanced guys that are starting to look at things like using face rec to reauthenticate using um, the other like the NFC. And we're adding uh, voice voice reauthentication this year. But yeah, I think those are 
you know, really, really nice to have, but the basic pieces you want to just do is enabling your users to have you know, SSO and then have really good security across shared devices. Nice. Yeah. You know, I think the other side of that too is we're also getting uh, slowly moving along this idea of the mobile device being the credential as well mm. to, to mm -hmm. like say log into a POS, you right. know, yep. when someone comes up to the counter to get to, to check somebody out and that person, you know, the, the device has been there, the, the POS station has been sitting there for a while. It locked up, you know, Rather than having to type back in and log back in again, maybe if they have a device they're out routinely using on the floor, mm -hmm. they can just hold that device up and use either, you know, whether it's Bluetooth or NFC mm -hmm. to just log back yep. in, get in and out of spaces, you know, in the building, automate processes, maybe use for a time clock to, to mm -hmm. check in and out, you know, from, from breaks or at the mm -hmm. beginning or end of your shift. So, I, yeah, I think there's I think that's the wonderful thing about these devices is there's a lot of flexibility. And I think Android is one of it, it kind of helps enable a lot of that flexibility sure to incorporate new technologies in the future as they become a little bit more prevalent as we see them grow in the space and more people ask for them and, and feel like there's a need for them. I think Android will be the platform that'll make it very easy to kind of plug that stuff in and incorporate it into your business as you go down the road. Yeah. Yep. So, I would agree. You know, yep. You know, so, I the agree. One, one other thing too, I, th I think you guys had mentioned earlier, thinking about AI, um, mm. you know, AI is not the end all be all. There's not a robot that's going to show up at work tomorrow and take our jobs. AI right. is something that makes our jobs easier. And if you just think about even like, you know, Google is a good example of this. Like it's, it's not a tool that's going to replace me or replace writing a, a term paper or doing your job. It's a tool that allows you to be faster and smarter. And I, I think AI is often misconstrued by a lot of people, but you, you have all this, you need good data. So you get data coming off the devices, you have analytics on what's happening and you can use that AI to actually make things better. I, I think the example John had around uh, you'd be able to get in based on a device or location or be able to unlock doors. And one of the things we're doing is you know, based on, uh, you know, if, if Brett is a user in the warehouse and he always logs in you know, at the same physical spot in the warehouse, you know, connected to this AP and he typically logs in between eight o'clock and nine o'clock and you know, tomorrow I'm at like a completely different warehouse or it looks like I'm logging in a completely different warehouse and in a different spot. It's, it's a higher security risk. So there's a different threat model associated with going somewhere else. And you could start to apply the AI and ML pieces to the data you're getting off to actually figure out, you know, how do you make the employees experience better while, while creating a higher level of security. So there's a lot of cool things that are going to happen in the next two to three years as we see more applications of this, but it's not going to be a robot replacing us. It's going to be these tools making our jobs better. Absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Agreed. All right. Well, hey, before we wrap up this conversation, I want to, as always, thank our uh, Tech Connect members who yep. make our show possible. Elo, Epson, Honeywell, and Zebra, we thank you so much for your support of the show. We could not do this without you. Hey, uh, if you've got some thoughts for us, if you want to connect with us, if you want to tell us what you think about the show, a few ways you can do that. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, for instance, give us a five-star rating and review, or at least give us the rating, but I would love to hear from you also. <laughs> tell us what you think about the show, good or bad. We will accept all criticism. Yep. We might be snarky about it, but we will accept it. <laughs> uh, if you uh, have some comments for us, if there's if there's things you want us to hear, you know, to tell us about on the show that you want to hear about, topics you want us to explore, you can find us on Twitter at TechConnectPod. You can also email us, techconnect at bluestarinc.com. All right, let's wrap things up with our recurring segments. Let's start off with the value to the VAR here. Uh, you know, and, and Brett, when we think about these rugged devices and our VARs selling them, I think we've given them a great, some great use cases for going out there and mm -hmm. talking to their customers and explaining to them why they need those devices in place. But let's take it a step further and talk about software partnerships because a lot of the software companies that we work with or that we encourage our VARs to work with are, they're making their software with, you know, a lot of rugged devices in mind. Yeah, Some of them may right. play in the consumer space also, but I think a lot of them in particular feel like, hey, there's something important to uh, using this particular application on a on a ruggedized device for this particular purpose. So can you explain to us maybe why selling those rugged devices can also help partnerships with the software companies be a little more, you know, a little more of an easy integration and a little more flow together that helps them put out a full solution that they can present to their retail partners? Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll just speak from our experience working with 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 bars and resellers, and really the you know, these devices add a lot of value, but you need the the process and the software that goes with it. So we have you know, we've been helping companies build enterprise apps um, for you know, the last thirteen years, and have focused a lot on rugged devices. And 
you know, we, we come to the table with how do we do this as fast as possible? How do we work with you guys to get devices piloted in stores or in warehouses as quickly as, as we can? And then the other pieces we have certain what we call accelerators. So we have things like the, uh, the buy online pickup or BOPIS accelerators, item inquiry, uh, ordering, restocking. We have pieces that we come and that are really out of the box. They work well. And, you know, we build the last 20% customized to our clients. And that, that really helps the, the resellers and, and bars we work with move a lot faster because they want to ship devices. And until there's working software on there, your end customer is not going to buy all the devices that, that, that they, they want to. Um, the other thing we talked about earlier is just the security pieces. We bring that, it, it works out of the box. Um, you drop it on to a device and it's just, it makes it easy for the end users to, to know what to do. You don't have to make it build anything complex and really helps simplify the process as you're deploying and managing devices. Yeah. I was talking to some IT resellers. I wanted to throw this out. It, it, that, that's all good stuff, Brett. Uh, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. One other good piece of good news, I guess, that I wanted to give to our reseller base out there is I've been talking to some IT resellers and some IS, uh, MSPs lately. And I can tell you there is a desire for them not to get into our world, they, the data capture world. I mean, they want to stay far away from, from what we do. And I think a part of it is because, you know, they're, they're special. They're specialize in something separate than the mobilized, ruggedized devices that we know, love, and can operate with. And so anyway, I, I took that as some good news that they don't want to get into the data capture world at all, uh, which is good news for us. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in our lane. They'll stay, they'll <laughs> stay in their lane uh, and we can help them along the way. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, Brett, I love the idea of this, the customization that Blue Fletch can bring to the table. I, I think that is that is such an important extra feature where not only can you approach someone and say, hey, we're going to give you these great devices that have XYZ features that you're going to need. Mm -hmm. We're going to partner you up with some software and get you the software that mm -hmm. you want running on them. But mm -hmm. it's also nice to be able to say, oh, and by the way, tell us what you specifically need. For, oh, yeah. for your environment. That's what right. do you need for your business that's a little bit different maybe than from your competitor down the street or to maybe to give you that differentiator from your competitor down the street? Well, let's bake that into the process also. Bake, I use one of your terms right there. Yeah. Let's put that into the process also and, and make sure that we are giving you that little extra piece that little extra customization that is about your business and your business only. And companies like Blue Fletch, I think, is what help enable that and make sure that that is you are getting software on your rugged device that is meant for you, for your business and your needs. You want to talk about a, a great selling point to go mm -hmm. in and sell a solution mm -hmm. and 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 tell your customer that you well, understand who they are and what they want. Yeah. That is a great talking point. That's what it's all about. As yep. a technology solution provider, you have to be able to do that. So, yeah, and have exactly. that conversation, yeah. Great. The field is there. That's right. Yep. All right. Hey, let's wrap up with our favorite segment each week, What's Tech Connecting with Us? This is where we talk something about the world of science, technology, innovation, something that's caught our eye, has our attention, that has got us a little bit excited or at least making us think a little hmm, bit. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, Brett, what's Tech Connecting with you this week? Um, I, I think I mentioned this earlier. Like the, uh, and I, I know this kind of goes against the Android versus Apple thing, but the new Apple laptops with the M1 chips, I feel yeah. like you you turn it on and it'll run for three days before you need to plug it in, which is spectacular. Just like the the battery wow. life is is it's incredible on those. So if you're if you're looking for a laptop that has good battery life, take a look at the uh, the new Apple M1 pieces. And just, they've done a great job with thinking about the you know what a laptop should be. Nice. Yeah, and how it's utilized and and how the CPU is used and stuff like that, right? Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Now, if they can only just make that happen with our smartphones and tablets and stuff too, like I've already this well, phone you're very is very demanding. I know, but this phone is maybe <laughs> two years old. I don't even know if it's that old yet, and I'm already at that point where, like, at the end of the day, I'm down to twenty percent if I haven't charged it. Well, point I can tell you, maybe that is the only quant the next quantum leap that they have to do because uh, all of my kids are not interested in upgrading their phone. It's it's like the first time ever, wow. you know, especially my middle daughter. She's she was always like, you know. Right. Hey, Dad, because whatever, we're on the two-year plan and stuff like that. Hey, Dad, do I get a new phone? Hey, right, Dad, do right. I get a new phone? She hasn't asked for a new phone in like a year and a half. And, oh, so, wow. and she's like, well, there's no need because the, the new phone doesn't really have – what what, yeah, what the, else the is it going to give me? The differences are becoming a little more negligible than they used to Very be. much so. It's not Very much so. Not the giant leaps from generation to generation. Yeah, anymore, but maybe yeah. a new chipset that, that enables this thing to last a little longer. Now, that would be a game changer. Yep. Yeah, they will probably do keep it. keep plugging we'll it in. Yeah, it. Plugging it battery, in. Tech, battery tech is coming to you, like some of the new batteries that – if you look at, I don't know if you guys watched the, you know, Elon Musk did the Battery Day, like it's sort of like a science fair type of thing last uh, last fall, and it's just 
the battery technology that's coming down is going to be really impressive in the next four or five years. So yeah. I think the, the EV car is really driving a lot of that, but that's going to make it back into mobile devices in the next three or four years. So I'm excited yeah. about that as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, here's what's tech connecting with me. Go are you? Are, I know you play games. Brett, do you, are you a gamer or were you at any point in your life? Did you play a Nintendo I, or something? I stopped at 18. I, I, I woke up. <laughs> so I, I got home from work. I, this is a funny story. I got home from work. I'm like, ah, I'm going to play video games for about an hour or two. I started playing. There was this, uh, I had a, a modem, so I dialed up to play this game called uh, Warcraft. And uh, I looked up and the sun was coming up and I had to go back to work. And I left. <laughs> that was the last, that was, I literally stopped playing games that day. That was it. All right. Well, what would you pay for a Legend of Zelda game in its original box from 1987? Not as much as somebody else did. I'm what, sure. what, what would what would the value of that Nintendo game be to you? I mean, how much did it originally cost? 50, 60 bucks? I'll pay that. Uh, at mo- back in 1987, I don't know, probably 30 uh, bucks. Maybe less than that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good point. No, you got to cough up $870,000 for an unopened I'm actually copy. surprised it's not in the millions somehow. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, who's spending this money? money you know i know gamers are are i don't know i you know i guess they're a, a unique bunch right but to have a, 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 a is that like the the analog version of a uh what, what have we the been NFTs? talking the nfts yes, right it is because it, i heard us because it wasn't <laughs> zelda there was another game recently that it may have been like one of the super mario brothers not even not old super mario brothers but yeah. maybe like something like an n64 version or something like that okay uh P, maybe uh, a ps3 or 3D, okay. Ah. Yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah. So, you know, we're yeah, the Super Mario 3D. So that was N64, I believe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we're not talking about old stuff. We're not talking about, you know, I mean, it's older now by comparison. Well, we're not talking okay. about something from the 80s or early 90s. We're talking about, you know, what, 15, maybe 20 years old at this point. Uh-huh. And, and yet a mint inbox version of that game was selling for hundreds of thousands, I think maybe even millions of dollars. Unbelievable. But yes, to your point, it is very much similar to the whole NFT thing. Yes. It's, it's, it's a symbol thing and I not guess. a... Not a real value because I, it's still just the game. It's just the game, right? And I understand the collectible thing. I get <laughs> and the whole one of thousands market, of them, but, I guess. But right? you get to that level of payment, and you're basically just saying oh, it's man. a it's a status symbol thing of like I have this thing that is mint condition in this box that I will never open, play, and use. Not use it for its intended purpose. And unlike a piece of art that you can admire on a regular basis, like it's literally just a game in a box. I don't, yeah, I don't get it. I, I, I don't, don't get, get it. it. Yeah, I, I well, in in this article, I guess the, the Mario Brothers one that you were talking about, uh, it was forgotten in a desk drawer. <laughs> that sold for six hundred and sixty thousand. Okay. It was so a maybe min- not as know, much, okay. but still. Yeah. Anyway, I I don't understand that. But uh, right. what's tech connecting with you? Uh, here's a headline for you: Robotic beverage maker Batrista raises ten million dollars. Okay. So uh, Batrista. Batrista. You know, clever little pun on barista. Barista. Yes. Batrista, and it's funny because Brett, you were just talking about robots aren't going to do all the stuff in retail for us, but apparently people are trying to make that happen here. <laughs> so this is a, a their premier, the company's called Batrista, but it says the company's premier product is simply named DrinkBot, and it notes, Batrista, it seems, is enough pun name to go around. <laughs> the latest version of the robotic drink mixing system features a refrigerated base with up to eight ingredients, a touchscreen control panel, and 14 separate nozzles for dispensing the mixed beverages. The entire process runs around 20 seconds. Now, Hmm. I got to say, you know, sometimes I hear some of these things and go, whatever, like, is that really necessary? Right. Yeah. This one I kind of get in a way because how often have you gone to get a drink, especially a mixed drink somewhere, and it's not quite what you were expecting? Like maybe yeah. they, they're a little too heavy on the vodka or a little too much on the sweets, you know, or the bitters or something. Oh, I don't and, know. Okay. Yeah, go I ahead. Mean, let's be honest. Most baristas, I'm going to oh, assume, so this is, are- This is in the bar world, right? It's in the, okay. Yes, in the drinks So I'm not going to see this right. at McDonald's next to that huge Coke kiosk that they have where you can go up and Probably select you know whatever not. but again but i could see that usage becoming a thing over time though where right. like or okay let's give you an example starbucks yeah because how often do people go to starbucks and they have their exotic crazy oh, orders yeah. or something Absolutely. You know, all the stuff yeah. they want yeah, 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 yeah. and you know the barista hopefully you know can get all of that right and gets it perfect yep. but i there has to be some kind of nice functionality to it if you could go and place that order and you just tapping in all the ingredients what you want and the bot kind of getting that right okay. for you. So I guess I can All kind right. of understand that. But at the same time, it's also like, man, this is is, is a an interesting company that, you know, I, I don't know what the end game of this, but apparently it's a, it was founded by a former Tesla engineer. 
Uh, they actually are looking at this around fountain drinks eventually in the future too, to like yeah. kind of how you've got those, you know, right. those Coke. Um, yep. What is it? The I can't remember they call it, the Coke machines that like can give you any type of flavor yeah. Yeah. that you want. Yeah, the freestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah. similar, but we're talking about kicking it to a next level, like for mixed drinks. I'm assuming for coffee, for exotic drink choices. I, I'm I'm interested. I don't know that it's ten million dollars. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't. I'm not buying just, it on the bar side. Go ahead. What you were gonna say, Brett? Are they Are they buying? Is this Is it? Are they mainly going after the uh, the bar market first? I, I think so. I think that's their initial. I don't know. They don't give a lot of details here. Like and and even like the images they show kind of show more of a. I'm not investing in for two reasons. I guess I like the heavy hand of the bartender from time to time. You know, well and that's bartender true. Bartender makes a, good point. a different old fashioned. You know, an old fashioned here tastes a little bit different than one in Nashville, and I'm okay with that. But if you're a bar owner, oh bar owners, I got gotcha. you. You don't want that bartender that is putting an extra shot. Oh, screw the bar something. owner. I'm all about and my charging experience. You for the, right, I know. I get that. I can see, but I can see that for the Okay, and here's my other one. Is Does, ba, what is it called again? Barista? Uh, bat- Batrista. Batrista. Yeah, that just doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Is it going to listen to my woes like a bartender Batrista. would and, and have be that shoulder to I'm cry thinking, on? I'm thinking no. I mean, it, well, it'll listen very well. It may not respond, but I'm sure it'll listen very well. That's what I want to see. I there's a there's a comedy like script right there. It's just like some right. guy hanging out in the bar, like this draped his arm draped over Batrista <laughs> or a drink bot. The robot keeps giving keeps robot keeps giving Dean his uh, his 32 ounce Red Bull vodka. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Exactly. What's your answer to that? Oh, just feeding me another drink. Yeah, I you're can see right. There's some intersection of AI there. Maybe you put some AI in there that recognizes like human features and human oh, emotions. Boy. It's like, yeah. oh man, this guy's having a rough day. I'm gonna put a little <laughs> bit extra in this one. You know, here you go, buddy. I put a little extra in for you. You know, I don't know. Anyway, so that's what's tech right. connecting with me. Patrista, come into us. a bar for in for near you. There <laughs> exactly. you go. All right. All right. Uh, Brett Cooper from Blue Flush, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate having you on the Thanks, show. Brett. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure. Definitely. And hey, it is unfortunately time for us to unplug. So until next time, tip your bartender. Maybe they'll give you a little extra that way. Uh, And until then, stay connected. Thanks, everybody. When choosing a POS solution, choose the leaders in touch technology, ELO. ELO touch computers are the surest, fastest way to get a POS application started and provide long-lasting use with a multitude of options. For modular configurations, ELO has the ELO Pause and iSeries touch computers, which are available in a variety of sizes, offer flexible mounting, and support for easy customization with a variety of ELO Edge Connect accessories to choose from for self-service and point-of-sale applications. If an all-in-one solution is what your customers need, ELO PayPoint has you covered, offering everything a merchant needs with a fully integrated receipt printer, barcode scanner, cash drawer, and MSR, all in one compact, sleek design. To learn more about how ELO can simplify your next POS project, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star ELO representative. Introducing the thinnest, lightest Zebra mobile computer yet. The EC50 Wi-Fi and EC55 Wi-Fi cellular enterprise devices represent a new category, an individually assigned mobile computer with an optional integrated scanner. Designed to always be on hand, ready to work hard wherever employees are and whenever they are needed, the EC50 and 55 have the great smartphone look and feel workers like, but the durable, reliable features enterprises expect from everyday use. Slip it in a pocket, wear it in a holster, turn it into a two-way radio or a fully featured mobile PBX handset, instantly transform the EC50 and EC55 into a fully functional workstation with a monitor, keyboard, and more by simply docking it to the workstation cradle accessory or snap on a trigger handle to bring comfort to any scan intensive task. With 10 hours of battery power standard or an extended battery for 13 hours, it's designed for a full day's work and then sell. To learn more, contact your Zebra representative or check out the link in the show notes.